What we're going to talk about today is culture, which is a kind of dark matter for the commercial world, not so much for the creative world, but it's exactly that thing, that interface between the creative community, the cultural creatives as we now talk, talk about them, and the, the world of commerce and the world of business and the world of, of some part of marketing doesn't really get the cultural proposition. The world has just got steadily more, more complicated, right? It changes almost as you look at it. Joseph Schumpeter is one of the great kind of economists here to glimpse the fact that capitalism was a creative destructive force in the world. He had no idea what the world was going to look like. He's active about 80 years ago. If we could you know, bring him back to life and prop him up, he would be astonished by just how destructive, how creative capitalism has become. The same is true of Elvin Toffler, right? This was the guy who talked about future, future shock, but the sheer force of the world, the speed of the world, how difficult that is, how new that is as a structural feature of our world. And I think he too would look at, at the speed at which we're moving now and go, oh my God. Clay, Clayton Christensen, of course, has this, has blessed us with this notion of disruption, given us this idea that disruption is built into the playbook of capitalism. So capitalism is now eating itself in some sense, right? The takeaway here for this little section is the sudden uh, difficult truth that capitalism is complicated and turbulent. The good news here is that the people in this room can help the corporation live in a world like this. So strategy is struggle, right? Strategy was the traditional way with which the corporation said, okay, what's out there and how do we make ready for what's out there? Peter Schwartz, this is the guy who was at Shell uh, and created the Global Business Network. And his notion is that uh, organizations exist in a state of perpetual surprise. You just sort of wake up one day and you go, oh my God, my business model just got ripped out from under me. What now? This is our own Michael Rayner. He was the co-author for the disruption book written by uh, Clayton Christensen. He, he, and he works here in Toronto, I think, for Deloitte. Um, but he wrote a book called The Strategy Paradox in which he said strategy is dead. It doesn't work. We can't use it the way we used to. That's how difficult the world has become. And uh, this, of course, is uh, uh, Nassim Taleb, the guy who talked about black swans. And for me, black swans is another language for disruptions, right? Stuff can happen. A black swan is something out there on the horizon that you can't anticipate. You can think as hard as you want about the future, but you can't anticipate this black swan until it's upon you, until it sweeps into the marketplace, rips your business model out from under you. Now, I don't think these guys are the least bit defensive about, <laughs> about what they're talking about here. I think this is a clear signal, right? When all of your experts have assumed this posture of, I'm really deeply nervous and anxious about what's going on here. You, they're sending us, they're using nonverbal language to send us a very clear signal. This is uh, uh, Andy Grove. He said, listen, here's how we do strategy now. We just act like a firehouse. Firehouses don't know where the fire is going to break out. They just have faster and faster fire engines. They just get better at getting to the fire when it does break out. And all that language about being agile is about the fire station model. It just says we don't know what the world has in store for us, so let's just be fantastically adaptable. When, when the world changes, we'll change with it. So strategy, the takeaway here for this section is strategy is struggling and we can help. So corporations and brands are in crisis. The overall category is of, of consumer uh, packaged goods is growing, but almost all of the big players are losing uh, share. And in the case of cereal, the, the, the top 100 brands are down by 5%. So all the big players are, are struggling to live in this new world. Capitalism and brandy, are, it's all topsy-turvy, and we can help. Okay, so let's talk about culture going to the rescue. This is, um, this is a world of commotion out there, but it gets simpler if you get culture. The world gets less black swanny. This is a little linguistic trend, right? Where people just put Y at the end of some term and it's supposed to make sense. And I always think, yeah, that kind of, no, it doesn't really work. But, but I'm using it, okay? Because I'm nothing if not trend sensitive. I think you can tell by the way I'm, I'm dressed. <laughs> so the world gets, uh, the world in general gets um, less uh, surprisey, <laughs> to coin another uh, beautiful word. And, uh, and, and we can do better than Firehouse if we, if we start using culture. That culture as a professional competence is, 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 is the professional comp competence for the cultural creative. It is 
our competitive opportunity. I think it's our difference. We've always said it's creativity, and it is creativity, but we can't do great creativity unless we have this connection, this great connection to culture. Creativity that's not rooted in culture has this kind of calorie-free kind of quality, right? It's not lasting, it's not impactful, it doesn't really change the brand, it doesn't really touch the consumer, and it doesn't really resonate with the culture in place. That's when you know there's a kind of cycle here, right? That you've done something that draws from culture, but it's so good, it's so powerful, it actually contributes to culture. So what is culture again exactly? Culture is on the rise, and we can think about it as three things, as meanings, rules, and motions. Roger A, he's a dog, and there are a lot of things he doesn't understand. He understands being hungry, understands mealtime, he understands walks, but uh, that's it. He's hardwired, and he doesn't have culture, and, and the, you know, his species made an evolutionary bet many millions of years ago. It said, we can choose between instinct that will give Roger every single solution he needs to every single problem, or, and that, this is the choice our species made, we'll send you into the world uh, uncoded. We'll send you into the world without instinct. You'll be open uh, to learning new systems, new languages, new cultures. Better than that, we can actually change the coding in your head. We can change the culture in your head. You know, we can train Roger, A, but that's all we can do is train him to fetch and to sit and to walk. But that's the extent of what he can ever learn about the world. Uh, let's take the example of the human. This is, I'm going to call him Roger B. As a human being, you can program. He got programmed by his childhood. We had to teach him what the world was. And in that process, we were teaching him culture. And now as he interacts with the world, even simple conversations in the elevator with perfect strangers, there are rules for how you do those. And that's one of the things I think so interests us about Aspies and people with autism. They, what they miss is culture. So you say, here's an elevator and here's a perfect stranger, and they're done for, right? Because they, they don't have that cultural code that says, in this situation, you orient your body like this, you conduct a conversation like this, here's just enough conversation, but not too much conversation. That's a cultural, it's culturally coded. And Roger B. has it. But this difference is a huge difference. So these are distinctions. All of these uh, are, all of these are containers. They all have the same function. You can carry things in them. But they're fantastically uh, different in price and in style. And one of them is worth like $14,000. Am I correct to say, does anybody want? Yeah, it's, I think it's this one here, but hey, my knowledge of culture, Roger B. and me have a hard time making some of these distinctions. I think it's this one. I think it's the Jane Birkin bag. But culture defines all of these things. If we think about self, gender, age, ethnicity, race, um, and our preoccupation with celebrity, that's being defined by culture. Uh, groupness, how we think about groups, how we think about style, how we think about entertainment, how we think about communication, all of this being uh, established by culture. So is there a Canadian advantage here? Canadians, just to choose a few examples here, this is Howard Innes, for whom the college at the University of Toronto is named. This is Malcolm Gladwell, this is Marshall McLuhan. All of these people were sensitive to culture and I think helped make their contribution through that sensitivity to culture. So when we've listened to our gurus, we've heard uh, a, a song about culture. 1950s is, was a very particular time and we can see um, Lots, it is a perfect storm. A lot of things come together. The biggest piece here is the World War, World War II had uh, demanded of us an extraordinary ability to control industrial production. We were turning out tanks, we were turning out bombs, we were turning out all that stuff, uh, and we got very good at making, and making machines make stuff. And people said after World War II, well, why don't we just start using all of that technology to think about food? And indeed, we, that's where we get that kind of people making jam on an assembly line. This is then a new approach to food. And so this is the kind of the Cambrian era where people just go nuts and start creating this stuff to the, you know, the tremendously, uh, the, to, to the clamor and the applause of consumers who said, yeah, the more processed, the better. The more industrial, the better. Comes out of a factory, that's what we want. 
So this artisanal trend to generalize, right, which we always want to do because we get caught up in the weeds, we miss this bigger picture, and the bigger picture says the shift in what consumers want moves from that industrial scale and those packaged goods to something that's human scale, handmade, relatively raw and untransformed, unbranded, personalized, made without adulterates, 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 um, a local, authentic, storied, that's that thing we were just talking about a moment ago, simplified, transparent, a kind of connoisseurship here and adored in certain communities, which proved to be, or you go to Detroit, um, you go to places from which the, the, the revolution sprang. This artisanal trend we're talking about, it's the thing that created this CPG crisis we were talking about. This is the culprit, this is the cause, this is the effect. So here are our giant corporations, Unilever, Coca-Cola, Nestle's, uh, P&G, struggling to get a handle on what's going on. Okay, so how do, we, how do we help our clients? And our first job here is to map culture. This is our map of London. It's to capture all the meanings anywhere, everywhere. Just as a matter of due diligence, just as a kind of first cut, let's know everything that's going on out there. For us, often, cultural meanings are that latest, hippest thing. It's the stuff that other designers or other cultural creators are thinking about. And that's the dangerous place to be. We just watched the Democratic Party watch the office of the president slip from their control until just a few days before the election, they thought they owned it. I mean, Hillary Clinton didn't go to certain states because she figured, done and done, we, we hold this, precisely because she wasn't attached to the full stretch of American culture that that debacle was ho uh, uh, possible. So we want breadth of coverage. We don't want just the latest things. We don't, we don't want to listen just to the coasts. We don't want to just listen to the elites. We want to listen to everybody. And then we want to, out of that subset, we want to figure out uh, which are the meanings, the cultural meanings that really work for the brand. And some brands have done this great job of just letting lots of culture run through them. And uh, Target, I think, could be a case in point here. Beautiful design consistency, all of this richness and diversity, really beautiful. And then we want to find out which of the cultural meanings work for the consumer. So all of these meanings in play, again, not just a few meanings, not just the latest thing, but there are always lots of meanings in play. Out of these meanings, we want to build an exquisite brand, not just um, with the, the right meanings, but we want, we, uh, or the current meanings, or the fashionable meanings, we want to build uh, uh, broadly. And then we want to stage the brand in the world, manifestations of the brand. And I've written a book called Culture Matic, and let me know if I can give you a copy. But, um, and that's the notion that brands are interesting when they stage events in the world and give us a glimpse of, uh, of meanings in action. Everybody in the C-suite, everybody in the corporation, when they want to do something, they produce numbers to justify their decision. And then we come along and say, we have a great idea for your brand. And the CEO says, so where are the numbers? And we say, well, we don't actually have any numbers. Just trust us. It'll be fine. Your career will be fine. Your kids will get to go to college. You won't have to sell the cottage. You'll be fine. Just trust us. Because look how hip our glasses are. How could you have any doubt about us as the people who know how to work with culture? We've always been, the client has come to us and said, oh, we need a refresh, can you enliven our brand? And that's, I think, old order advice giving. We need to give the entry moment and the exit moment. Right? We, we, we kind of, we refresh the brand and we go, our work here is done. Um, call us if you need something. Our work now is, this is when we want you to get into this cultural moment, and here's when we want you to get out. And that moment is probably 18 months. This is the stuff of an enduring connection, right? These people are giving me long-term kind of forecasting as opposed to here's something new, thank you very much. There's no such thing as going, great, nailed it, our work is done. That's just a moment. It's just an episode in a continuous series. Uh, and I think that's what our clients are asking us for. That's what we're selling them, is that continuity through, through this turbulent space. Culture is, I think, a big competitive advantage here. And as Thomas was saying, you know, it's been hard to see. But now it's, it's time for us to see it clearly because it is so much a part of our competitive advantage. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.